A demon tried to kill me once, and now I hunt down demons. I got off the bus and light up my cigarette. My brother had given me the address, as he often does when he finds me nearby a possession. Benefits of being connected to the Catholic Church, I guess. I thumb the iron ring on my right hand finger as I make my way to the front porch. The mailbox on the front reads Porter. I flick my cigarette at it before I open the door without knocking and head in. A few folks huddle together around a door at the top of the stairs. All of them seem concerned. The sounds of a priest and the garbled wailing of some poor bastard inside. As I walk past them, each stares at me, confused. Who the hell are you? A woman asks. The wife of the possessed, or maybe the mother. She could be either. I'm here to help, I say as a young priest bursts out of the room with some rather putrid vomit on his vestments. Do not go inside. Father Smith said all is well and under control. More shouting and the sound of more demonic gobbling and laughter come from behind the door. That sounds like he's got a handle on it, but if you don't mind, I'd like to have a crack at it. I tell the priest as I walk past him. The priest grabs the doorknob, intending to open the door himself. No, I... He struggles. The door! It's locked! He attempts to tug on the doorknob before he shouts in pain. His hands appear burned. As I touch the doorknob, I notice it's red hot. I tap my ring against it. It cools immediately and unlocks itself. If you don't mind. I open the door and close it behind me. The door locks behind me. I'm hit with a putrid smell as I walk in. There's vomit cover in the bed and a priest standing at the side of the bed who's reading from the Bible. A man convulses and writhes about on the bed. He looks middle-aged, dark-skinned, and has an unkempt beard over his face. His eyes roll into the back of his head and nasty vomit covers his beard, along with what I'm pretty sure is feces. The priest looks to me, surprised. Who are you? I shrug. Just a guy here to kick that demon out of whatever sorry sap it hopped into. I throw the soiled sheets off the bed and straddle the guy's chest. What in God's name are you doing? The priest protests. Are you mad? The man in a harsh demeanic voice chuckles. Foolish mortal. What can you do that the priest cannot? Well, this for one. I press my fist against his forehead, sure that my ring is firmly pressed against his flesh. Demon screams as the guy's back arches and his writhing intensifies. What is this? It screams. I lean down, whispering into its ear. Calvary. He bucks up and down, doing his best to throw me off him like a wild bronco. I hold on firmly with my thighs, noticing that each buck and attempt to push me off him grows weaker and weaker. A few more moments of writhing and plenty of inhuman screaming, the guy goes limp. I keep my ring pressed against his forehead for another moment or two before removing it and then get off him. An even more foul stench comes from the bed as I inspect the guy who's limp and now snoring. A brown stain spreads onto the sheets from underneath him. Did he... The priest holds up a cloth to his face, covering his nose. Soil himself, yes. The priest turns to me. The demon made him eat his own excrement, thus the putridness in this room. Uh, these folks got a bathroom? I asked, noticing my hands must have come into contact with the guy's scraggly beard. Who are you? I'm someone who kicks demons out of people. I show him the iron ring on my finger as I walk out of the room. Is Rain gonna be okay? One woman asks. I walk out, stopping at the bathroom to wash my hands. After a change of pants, a long shower, and a moment to reflect in the mirror, he'll be okay. Probably. With little else to do, I walk out. What do you mean, probably? You can't come into our home and- Gina, please, the priest interrupts. You're making a fool of yourself. The priest looks to me. I demand you tell me who you are. As I light up another cigarette, I turn to him. Someone who's not against you. The priest raises an eyebrow to me and smiles a bit. I see. 
God bless you. Expecting to have spent more time here, I now walk down the street to get to the next bus stop. I need to get a car. That's about when my phone rings. Hello? Get your ass home now! My father's gruff voice comes over the phone. Hey, Dad. I say as I pull another drag for my cigarette. Did you see the news? No, I was a little preoccupied, I explain. Jerusalem got attacked. It's the beginning of the end, just like the angel said. I nod, trying to make a smoke ring. I failed, as usual. Yeah, I know. I already called your brother. He's on his way. <sighs> yep. I sighed, taking another inhale. I've got the bunker prepped, he shouts. When you get here, we seal ourselves in and we wait out the apocalypse. Sure thing, Dad. See you soon. Mom is yelling in the background. Damn it, Fred. Please don't pester the boys. Sandy, for the love of God, get the canned food down into the bunker. It's the last thing Dad said before the call ended. I shoved the phone in my pocket and start at the nearest train station. Dad's going off the deep end isn't new and I can't blame him. Ever since my brother and I were kids and had a run in with the Prince of Hell, yeah, he's been twitchy. I guess that's where this story should start, huh? It seemed like a normal school night. My brother and I went to bed and we were sound asleep when my mother came in with the strangest request. Wake up, kids, she had told us. I need you both to drink this, okay? I looked at my mother's hazel eyes as she looked at us in a calm yet urgent manner. What is it? My older brother asked. It's blessed water. I need you both to have a drink. My older brother didn't seem put off, and neither of us thought Mom was the cultist sort, so we each took a drink of the water she gave us. The best description I can give of the stuff was pure, and that's how I felt afterward. Relaxed, pure, and content. Okay, boys. Back to bed, okay? She gave us both a kiss on the forehead and left the room. Without thinking about it, I passed out again. Later that evening, we woke up because of a loud banging on the front door. Mom was shouting downstairs, and my brother and I ran out of our rooms. Oh, look. These are the children. An older man's voice wheezed. Standing in the doorway was a guy in a white suit and a wide-brimmed hat. I couldn't see much of him other than a sick grin as he stared down my mother. She was holding a shotgun but his free hand was on the barrel, keeping it pointed away from him. Now the fun can begin. Whore. He grabbed my mother's hand and out of nowhere it began to burn with light blue flames. He recoiled in pain, screaming an inhuman voice as his hand turned black. With that, Mom pointed the gun back at him. Now back the fuck off, asshole! The guy in white hissed at my mother, but his grin returned. I would have had fun with you. Use these kids as leverage to turn you into my personal little concubine. But now, well, it seems you must burn. Mom shut the door in his face and ran upstairs. Kids, get back to bed, okay? Everything is fine. There was some rustling in the garage. The sound of something snapping against the door followed. Mom ran down to the door to the garage and tried to open it. But try as she might, she couldn't budge it. What the hell? I spotted the guy in white running past the front window. Mom! I shouted and pointed. She looked at the front door. Soon the snapping noises came from behind it. She rushed to the door just like the garage. It refused to give. Oh god, kids, out the back door! Hurry! By the time my brother and I even got to the base of the stairs, the snaps were at the back door. That's when we spotted the man in white at the windows, grinning as he used my dad's nail gun to secure the window shut. Mom grabbed both of us and rushed to the house phone. Shit, it's dead. She hung up and there was more snapping outside at each window. Mom gripped us when the man in white worked his way back to the front window. I'll always remember his yellow eyes glowing as he held up a gas can, his muffled voice echoing through the glass. If you don't want to burn in hell, you'll burn the normal way. He lit a match. Remember, this is all your dear father's doing. Flames rose around them and soon were at the outside of each window. 
Come on, kids, downstairs! Mom shouted and rushed us down to the basement. She locked the doors at the top of the steps and hit the lights. Kids, go turn on the water in the utility sink and get Mama all the towels, okay? The smoke detector started to beep harshly upstairs as we set to work. I started getting towels when my brother turned on the sink. All the while, smoke started to seep in from under the door to the stairs. Mom grabbed the towel from me, soaked it, and ran it upstairs. She shoved it under the door and then came back downstairs and started soaking more towels. Kids, you remember when you made that blanket fort and I told you not to? Well, guess what you're allowed to do now? The smoke detectors began to make a weird whining sound as the heat from the flames outside melted them. Despite my brother and I's best efforts, we weren't able to get the towels to stick together. Mom, I found the blanket! My brother proclaimed as he pulled a rather ratty looking thing out from a corner of the basement. Mom picked it up and looked up to the door at the top of the stairs. The door was smoking now. Okay, guess beggars can't be choosers. Mom spent the next couple of minutes washing the blanket as best she could, and while it was still wet, she pulled it out of the sink and turned off the water. She grabbed a flashlight, and as she did, the lights turned off. Okay, kids, come on under the blanket, alright? There was a crash outside, and me, being ten, started to cry. My brother held me tight as Mom brought the blanket over us both. It'll be okay, boys. Mama's here, and we have the blanket, right? It'll protect us. More popping, crashing, and burning noises echoed down from the top of the stairs. My brother looked to my mom and asked her, Mom, are we gonna die? My stomach dropped and I turned to her, hoping that she had the answers. Mom held us both tightly and shook her head. No, babies, we will be just fine. We're just giving the firefighters time to come save us, okay? They will come back and hack through the door and they'll find us down here and you'll get some hot cocoa when this is all over, okay? When you're a kid, sometimes you can understand when parents are lying to you. Now, this is one of those times. I didn't want to cry anymore, I'd done that. So I laid my head on my mother's lap and curled up there, wet blanket on my legs. The glass shattered upstairs and the sound of roaring fire intensified. We felt the rush of hot air hit against the blanket. Mom poked her head out in time to see the towel she shoved under the door was at the base of the stairs. The door itself was burning now, with the top of the staircase enveloped in flames and smoke. That's when I saw his face looking at us through the basement window outside. <sighs> Those yellow eyes burned into my memory as he grinned wickedly. He waved. The sick bastard waved to me before he vanished. Now the basement was filling with smoke and Mom closed the surrounding blanket, pushing us to the floor. Grab a towel, kids! The ones we got wet and put it over your mouth, okay? It'll protect from the smoke. We just need to hang on until the firemen come. Mom instructed us. I did what I was told, hoping Mom knew what she was doing. My older brother was lying on the other side of Mom, and she had her arms over each of our shoulders. That's when I heard a door open and someone walked in. My mom lifted the blanket to see who was there, and what happened next shocked me. Standing in the middle of the room, wearing a black trench coat, jeans, and a pair of heavy boots was a guy. He stood a little over six feet tall, had black hair and bright blue eyes. The second I saw him, he began to walk over to us, kneeling down to my mother. Mrs. Macchioni, I'm an associate of your husband. I'm here to help. Who are you? Mom questioned. The man turned and motioned to a doorway behind him. I don't mean he turned and pointed to the door going upstairs or to the sealed Bilko doors. I mean he pointed to a new doorway that was not there mere moments ago. Come with me, please, the man implored. The smoke was burning my eyes as I looked to my mom for the okay. That man set our house on fire, tried to do God knows what to me. How do I know you aren't with him? She asked. You need to trust me, he explained. Mom shook her head. I don't have any reason to trust you. For all I know, she coughed. <coughs> You have an even worse fate for me waiting behind that door. With that, the man stood up. He looked around and looked at my mother, exasperated. In a quick motion, he removed his trench coat. The smoke billowing around him had potted, and the flames on the ceiling cooled as huge silvery white wings spread out from his back. Through the haze of smoke, the wings were so bright they appeared to glow. Oh my god. It was all Mom could say as it stunned into silence. The angel held out his hand. 
Come with me, please. Mom took his hand, nodding dumbly, and we walked toward the open doors. 